We launched OpenCog as an open source project in 2008, but it was actually a continuation of a project we'd started in 2001 as a proprietary AI system. The proprietary system was called the Novamente Cognition Engine. We launched it inside my startup company, Novamente LLC. But by the time 2008 rolled around, it became clear to us we weren't making the kind of progress that we really wanted. We were doing okay, but we didn't see ourselves getting to a human level thinking machine anytime soon. Not that right. So we figured, what the heck? Open source the code, see what additional participation we could get from around the world. When you launch an open source project, you can get contributions from all over the place, from universities, companies, government agencies, private individuals who just have spare time, they want to contribute to your project. We didn't know exactly what to expect. One of the big surprises once we open sourced OpenCog was the involvement that we got from Asian universities. I started a collaboration with Xiamen University in China, a small city on an island in Fujian province, just across the water from Taiwan. Some students in Xiamen University connected OpenCog to a humanoid robot, a little white humanoid robot bought from France, the now robot. OpenCog controlled the little robot walking around in the lab, holding simple conversations, planning its actions, recognizing objects. This sort of collaboration would not have been possible if we'd kept OpenCog as the proprietary Novamente cognition engine. The next Asian collaboration was OpenCog Hong Kong a collaboration between my company Novamente and Hong Kong Polytechnic University. This was a Hong Kong government grant, a corporate matching grant where my company put in part of the money, the Hong Kong government put in the rest. This is funding six AI programmers to work on using OpenCog to control intelligent video game characters. And we're doing that from two purposes. <coughs> And we're doing that for two purposes. First of all, to create intelligent game characters that can really be used in video games. We want to commercialize the technology so as to make money and also so as to get millions of video game players around the world to collaborate on teaching our AI as part of their game playing experience. And the second goal being to work toward building a thinking machine. Because once you think about it, you see that using an AI to control a video game character is confronting nearly all the hard problems of AGI. What do you have in a video game world? You have perception, you have action, you have abstract cognition, you have social interaction, you have emotion, you have the need for planning across various different scenes and situations, spatio-temporal inference. Pretty much everything we need to do to be a human is contained in some simplified form in a video game world. I'm not sure that a video game world is enough to get us to human level intelligence. My guess is that we're going to need to use OpenCog to control robots, exploring natural environments, perceiving the rich natural world and interacting with the world with the same kind of richness that the human body can. But even if we need to go to robots eventually, we can prototype nearly every aspect of our AGI architecture in the video game world. Doing AGI development in China has been a real lot of fun. There's a really high level of energy here. It's unlike anything I've seen in the U.S. since the late 90s with the dot-com era. I founded my first AI company, WebMind, in New York City in the late 1990s. We were on Broad Street, near Wall Street, in a scene that was called Silicon Alley back then. 
Silicon Alley was not as well known as Silicon Valley in California, but it was every bit as exciting with more of an emphasis on media and on hard technology rather than website stuff. Back then in the US, in the dot-com era, there was a real feeling of enthusiasm and excitement. You had young people coming together to form new companies, building new technologies with a real deep confidence. With a really deep confidence, they're going to change the world. We didn't know exactly how we were going to change the world. We knew the internet was going to be a huge thing. We knew the internet would be tremendous. We knew that some kind of internet technology was going to dominate the world during the next decades. But we didn't know exactly what kind of technology it was going to be. So there was a feeling of great open-mindedness. Investors were funding all sorts of internet projects. People were thinking in every possible direction about what the internet might turn into. Not everyone made money then. As it turned out, WebMind, my first startup, didn't do that well. But we developed a lot of cool ideas, a lot of great technologies. And on the whole, the thinking, the science, the technology built during the dot-com boom laid the ground for what the internet is today. The same enthusiasm I saw in America during the dot-com boom, I see right now in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, in Beijing. I see young people coming together to build new technologies with a belief in their hearts it's going to change the world. And I see a great optimism about the future. America still has an awful lot going for it. Probably 75% of the top universities in the world are in the USA. You've got Apple, Google, Microsoft, IBM, a lot of great companies in America doing a lot of great things. But you don't have the same kind of feeling, the same kind of attitude of open, unbounded growth. Like each year, things are getting better and better. Like each year, more and more new things are, are being invented, being rolled out in the world. You had that feeling in the US in the dot-com boom, and you have that feeling here in China right now. I have to say Hong Kong is probably the most alive and vibrant place I've ever worked. It's really a non-stop pace of life and pace of working. Historically, the United States has been the site of almost all the AI development to happen in the world. All the major AI paradigms have really come to fruition in America. But all that history of AI in America is both a strength and a weakness. It's a strength because there's a richness of knowledge about AI and of the practical application of AI technologies that you don't find anywhere else in the world. It's a weakness because the AI ideas that have served America so well in the past probably aren't good enough to lead us all the way to human level AI. Yet the AI funding agencies in the US, the major companies using AI in the US, are kind of reluctant to shift from the AI ideas that have served them reasonably well in the past. They're kind of reluctant to invest in wacky new AI concepts like OpenCog. On the other hand, in China or Korea or other Asian countries, you don't have that same kind of history. You have a lot more openness to wild new ways of thinking about AI. The Chinese government and the major Chinese corporations, they know they need artificial intelligence. They want service robots. They want AIs to help coordinate all their infrastructure systems. They want AIs to help educate their population better. They want AIs for dozens of things across the board. If you look at the latest science and technology plan of the Ministry of Science in Beijing, AI is there all over the place, far more than you see it in the planning documents of American or European governments. So the Chinese government knows they want AI, but they don't know how to do it and they don't think they know how to do it. It's been easier for me with my somewhat novel and eccentric approach to AI 
to find interest in funding here in China than in America, the Chinese recognize that OpenCog is a bit out there, that it's a different way of thinking about the problem, but they like that. They're not wedded to any good old-fashioned approaches to the AI problem. I also think the holistic aspect of OpenCog appeals somewhat to the Asian mindset. There's a lot of people in the West who think about AI in terms of one silver bullet, one magic algorithm that's going to solve everything. The Chinese are more used to thinking about complex integrated systems, about holistic systems where all the parts contribute, putting in their own unique aspect, and the behavior emerges from the whole. OpenCog is very much like that. We have many different ingredients. You have PLN over here, our logical inference system. Moses over here, our procedure learning system. You have episodic memory, you have perception, you have action. All these different parts come together, forming a synergetic whole, which leads to intelligence. This kind of focus on synergy and emergence and complementarity is very natural to the Asian mindset. We've also seen some cases where the Asian culture, the Asian mentality of the developers working on the system has had some impact on how the development goes. One of the members of our Hong Kong AGI team, Shai Jemwa, he was given the task of programming the emotion and motivation system of OpenCog. One of the first things he said when he saw the design I wrote was, wait a minute, you haven't given social adjustment and social harmony as one of the top level goals of your system. We'd provided the AI initially with a number of simple top level goals like feeding itself inside the virtual world, learning new things and experiencing novelty, pleasing its human teachers, but we hadn't thought to supply a top-level goal of social harmony and getting along well with others and pleasing its peers. So Jamwa, with his Chinese mindset, looked at our motivational system and said, wait a minute, you've given the social aspect short shrift. So he implemented the initial motivational hierarchy of the OpenCog system in a way that reflected his own Asian values along with the Western thinking that had gone into our original design. Right now, OpenCog is fairly simple in terms of what it can do. So the social and emotional aspect isn't all that sophisticated. But as we go further down the road toward creating more and more advanced AGI, it may well be that the Asian setting has a significant impact because the people interacting with the system as it grows up aren't just going to be Americans, they're going to be a mixture of Westerners and Chinese.